Hello and welcome to a new edition of the Fingal's Cave podcast. Today, we have another wonderful guest. In 1998, he launched one of the biggest Pink Floyd fan websites called The Fleeting Glimpse and is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year. There are few people who have shown more commitment, love and knowledge for Pink Floyd over such a time. So Ian and I are really happy to have him with us today. Welcome, Cole Turner. Thanks, Nils. How are you? And thanks, Ian. How are you? Uh, I'm bearing up under the strain. <laughs> no, I'm pretty good. good. To have I'm you great. Ready, so you're in Australia uh -huh, right now, thank you. which means uh, we have quite early in the morning here in Europe, and uh, you're in the middle of the day. <laughs> uh, it's evening time here, actually. It's... Um, Oh, evening, evening uh, time. Yeah, yeah, it's evening. So, oh, yeah. great. Mm -hmm. It's dark outside. So, yeah. um, <laughs> first thing we would love to know um, is because we are a Pink Floyd podcast, mm -hmm. of course. And the first thing is sure. uh, very interesting to us to know what are your first memories of Pink Floyd? What are your first encounters with the band? How long have you got? <laughs> it's going to take time. some time. <laughs> Yeah, I'll tell you, um, I, I've got to give you a bit of background to this as well, so you understand where I'm coming from. Um, I used to be a mod. I don't know if you know what a mod is. That In the 60s in the UK, we used to have mods and rockers. Mod meaning modern, rockers meaning whatever. Uh, if you saw the uh, uh, the Who film, I think it was uh, Quadrophenia, Quadrophenia. Where they were fighting on the beach. Yes. yes. Yeah, uh -huh. that was all about mods and rockers. And I was a mod. And I used to go to the little clubs in Soho and that, on Friday, Saturday night, see uh, mainly disco type things. But sometimes you'd get uh, a live band, but nothing much. And one, one day, somebody in our crowd said, um, there's something interesting going on in Tottenham Court Road in London tonight. And it's called a happening. And um, I reckon we should all go there. And so a crowd would said, well, we don't know what it is, but we'll rock on up anyway. So we went to Tottenham Court Road fairly late at night. It was dark. And as we were approaching the club, we could hear a bit of noise coming out of the club. But the first thing I saw was a guy standing in the middle of the road in his underpants <laughs> with long <laughs> hair spinning round and around and around. And I'm going, well, what's, go what's going on here? What's going on here? And then... We found out later on that he'd been taking LSD. And LSD at that time uh, was legal, I think. It became illegal just shortly after that. But he'd been taking a cocktail of that and speed, and he was just off his face. So we go into this club, and the guy outside, that was only one instance. Inside were all these freaky-looking people that we'd never seen anything like it in our life. It was just incredible. And then the band started to come on stage. The, the, the club, was, it, it, when I first started, or the first time I went there, there were probably maybe 200 people in the club, if that. And um, the bands come on, you know, they, they, they do their set, they go off. I can't remember who was on the first time I went there. I found out that that was the 23rd of December 1966, if you're interested. And mm -hmm. um, we waited, waited, waited. And uh, this band came on and said, ah, good evening. We're the Pink Floyd. Who's Pink Floyd? Never heard of them. So off they went, starting to, doing their stuff. And oh, oh, I love bloody, load of bloody rubbish. This is just cacophony of sound. It was just horrible. We were just, <laughs> just uh, didn't know what was going on. But I started to listen and I thought, hang on a minute, they, this band uh, has actually got something. It's There's a load of rubbish, there's a load of crap. But if you can tear away that crap, there's a bit of brilliance going on in there. I, I, I didn't recognise it at first, but mm. it, there was something that's stirring in my mind. And so uh, the next week, I think it was, uh, a few of us went back. A few had dropped out because I didn't want to mess with these hippies. And um, I went back the next week and saw them again. And I thought, oh, well, they, they, they really have got something. And then I used to go to every single UFO at Tottenham Court Road. I think it was there for about eight months off the top of my head. And then it moved to uh, Chalk Farm, to the Roundhouse in Chalk Farm. And I used to go there. 
But there was also another club called Middle Earth, and that was in Covent Garden. And the Floyd used to play there occasionally, not that often. As a matter of fact, I, I spoke to Nick a couple of weeks ago about it, and he said, no, we didn't play there that often. But we played UFO all the time. And I said, well, what was the draw of UFO? And he said, it was the money. It was the only gig we could get. So I figured, <laughs> all right, that was good. So, <laughs> so that was my first introduction to Pink Floyd. And because once you get the taste, and you guys know this, and any Pink Floyd knows this, once you get the taste, you just can't get rid of them. They're, they're stuck in your mouth forever, you know. You just, you just love them. And um, I, I followed them. I followed them from... Uh, well, 67, all of 67, I got to as many gigs as I could. Uh, it was awkward because I was working at the time, uh, so it was awkward to get to any midweek gigs outside of London. But then I lucked out and I got myself a job as a road manager with a band, and so I had a lot of, lot of free time. So I sort of got to see a lot of gigs that were out of town. But mostly I, I saw them in 67. And then 68 and 69, 70, it sort of tapered off a bit because then they were touring overseas and, and whatever. Um, mm -hmm. So I didn't get to see them quite as much. But I have a little follow-up story, if you don't mind me just mentioning this Go for it. and uh, okay when i came to australia uh, i met my wife in australia and she's from liverpool by the way and um i was raving on about this band pink floyd i loved them but you know you're never going to see them uh, unfortunately they're an english band they, they tour europe but you know they're never going to come to australia whoops 1971 i pick up a paper and there's an advert in the paper festival hall melbourne Pink Floyd. I went, you're kidding. So I grabbed my wife and off we went to the gig. It was a couple of weeks later, of course. And in those days, you couldn't buy tickets online. There's no such thing as an internet or anything like that. And so we go to the box office and I say, two tickets, please. And she said, where would you like to sit? And I'm like, what? <laughs> so they gave us seats. Bang in the middle, about seven rows back. I, I can't remember exactly how far, but we were sitting there. And the crowd built up and built up and built up to 500. That was it. There was only 500 people at that show. And they were doing, I think it was Atom Heart Mother or something. No, that might have been a bit early. I can't remember. But uh, mm. and I, so I saw them in, in Australia for the first time. And they, oh, I was so stoked. And they did that one in Melbourne. And I think they did two in Sydney and Japan. The hack on, I think that's how you say it. That's um, right. Yeah. So, yeah, right. That was, that was it. And then Gap. No internet, no communications as such. Read about the wall shows in um, in uh, Elf's Court. Um, figured something was still going on, but couldn't get any information about them. And then in 1988, they toured Australia. And that was it. I, I could only afford to go to three of the ten shows that they did in Melbourne where I was living at the time. But, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, was that a concert? Was that fantastic? And then at that, at that set of concerts, one of those three, I said to myself, I want to meet these guys. I am, that is, I'm determined one day I am going to get into the Floyd camp and find out what's going on inside. I really want to meet these guys. And that's mm -hmm. my start of my story. Wow. That's some story, isn't it, Nils? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've got to go straight in there with the questions because I'm back in the UFO sure. club at the start of your story, as, as you might imagine. And um, you're there in late 66 and early 67. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. you stay with it in the spring do you yep. recall seeing a difference between those earliest performances that you were present at and the spring ones were, were things changing yeah w without a doubt ian um mm. i think the first time I, I noticed a major change i saw the uh, two free hide concerts, I think. I'm a bit slack on dates these days, but I think they played their 68 and 70. And yeah. um, and when I saw them play at Hyde Park, which was a, a, a big jump from the little club UFO, um, mm. 
Well, uh, 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 well, this is a different band. I mean, uh, this is something is going on. You, you could tell. And when I went to the 1971, uh, the, the 68 show, there weren't that many people. There might have been 500, 1,000. I think mm. half a million turned up in 1970. Yeah. And yes, that's when you could re- absolutely tell that they'd, they'd, they'd changed, they'd come along. And because by that time, Sid had left. Um, yes. And David was out front. And yeah, it, it to- mm. totally changed. Totally changed. Mm. So. Cole, I was thinking about um, 19. 19- 66 into 1967 mm-hmm. and yeah. how you saw the band develop in those very early times because you said earlier that there was just a lot of noise and you could tell that there were bits that were brilliant yeah did that yeah. did that change for you in in those uf ufo visits that you did um or do they all kind of mould into one in your memories? Well, yeah, it's pretty much a, a moulding of one. But I, mm. I can tell you a little story. In the, I was at the 14 hour certainly colour dream in, in mm. Alexander Pass. Uh, and that morning they came on in, it was dawn. <laughs> the sun was came, coming up and they came on and they were a totally different band to what I'd known from UFO. So uh, I, I can't remember when the 14 hour the Colour Dream was, uh, but that would have been 67, 68, something like that. And yes, there was an a, absolute difference. Um, oh no, it must have been it must have been 67 because Sid was still with them. So mm. uh, yes, but there there was they 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 became polished. The, 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 a lot of the a lot of the um, what do you call it when they just, just go up by themselves and do their, their thing, which Sid used to do a lot at UFO. Um, the, a lot of that improvisation, a lot of that improviso- improvisation had gone and it was more, uh, right, this is what we're playing, these are the notes that we're supposed to play, this is how we're supposed to sing. Yeah, so I did notice the difference uh, between UFO and 14 hour and Colour Dream. That's when, I, that's when it first hit me how professional they'd become, how much they'd change. And Sid was still with them at that time. But mm-hmm. because after that, when David came on board, the sound changed again. So. I wonder if that was fame that changed them between those times. <laughs> Obviously, um, they'd got singles out by that point. That's true. Um, hard to say. You know, I, 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 I don't know. It's possible. Um, it's possible that they, they was the by this time, late 67, they were com- becoming huge. They, they were monstrous. Well, in my scene, they were monstrous. They became even bigger later on. But, um, uh, yeah, they, they, they just started to, to grow from there. And you, you could see, you knew something was going to happen. You, you just knew that they were going on to bigger and better things. Um, I would like to go on about you folks just a little bit more. Um, a friend I sure. used to know who used to own a shop in um, Notting Hill Gate, Bill Allerton, um, standout records yeah. if you knew your record shops in, in Notting Hill back in the 90s. He mm. used to say to me that when he went to UFO, um, that it was yeah. incredibly loud um, and it was really quite difficult to make out what the band was playing. Would you agree that was the case? Absolutely. Absolutely. First, to start off with, absolutely, because uh, I think they just turned up everything as loud as they possibly could. Uh, and I just remember, that I, this is after I'd been, been five or six times, that uh, the, the whole place, it was sweaty, it was hot, and it was loud. And you'd go outside, I think you were allowed to smoke inside, I'm not sure, but I remember going outside a few times, and there was a grate in the pavement. I'm talking about Tottenham Court Road and UFO mm. used to be in a cellar. So you'd go down steps to get into it. But I, I remember coming outside to have a cigarette or for whatever reason and standing out on the pavement at Tottenham Court Road and had a, a, a glass a grate or grill or something or other that we stood on, but there were air holes in it <laughs> and it was freezing cold 
but you can still on the air holes, you got hot because of the heat rising from all the bodies right. in the club. <laughs> so, mm. yeah. Happy memories, happy memories. Um, so I was just going to carry a little bit more about youth folk because there's nothing better than talking sure. to somebody who was at youth folk. Um, mm -hmm. So you'll have yep. to forgive me. But one of the things that no, we often talk about, obviously, is recordings uh, made there. And we know that um, the German film crew was there for De Young yeah, and Art yeah. Wandler. We know, mm -hmm. um, obviously, that Granada did their filming for yes. yep. um, their documentary. Um, yeah. And uh, we know that probably the dope film was, was filmed there. Yes. We don't know mm -hmm. for sure about that. There's, there's debate from time to time. But I, I mm -hmm. wonder um, about with that small space, that incredibly loud sound, whether that was an environment yeah. where filming and audio recording was really possible. Do you, would you say it was? Would you say anybody was really thinking about such things at the time? <laughs> no, no. I, 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 no. I do have vague memories of film crews being there, but mm. that's that's it. Just the, I just remember the cameras being there one night. Uh, uh, there's a, a famous... Uh, UFO photograph of people sitting down in the crowd and looking up at Sid and Floyd playing on stage. And I think that I can identify myself in, in that photograph. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That would um, be fascinating. I, 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 oh, it was. I, I, I will, will tell you, everyone was stoned those days, by the way. You obviously gathered that yeah. everyone was just taking drugs and just get off their mm. faces. And, so you didn't really know what was going on. But um, I do have a, a story to tell you, which has got nothing to do with Pink Floyd. It's got to do with UFO. Um, and I remember sitting on the steps going down to the club one night. Uh, I don't know why we were sitting there. There was a crowd of us sitting there. And the, the door of UFO opened up. And suddenly this huge, and I mean huge, sausage, sausage balloon came out the door and with people on strings pulling it up the steps and took it out onto Tottenham Court Road and the, the tail of it was still in the basement a few folk. So it's just amazing and because everyone was off their face and going, oh, What's this all about? <laughs> and to this day, I don't know what it was all about, but I remember it, I think. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I think anything went there, didn't it? Um, <laughs> no, it, did. it did. It did. It did. Yeah. Yeah. It was, a, it, it was um, I've got to say this, it, it was, it was fun, one of the best times of my life. It really was. It was just... Mm. It, summer of love i remember in when you interviewed rosemary and she talked about the 60s and she was bang on they were very very special mm. days 1967 mm. especially and it ran through 68 tapered off a bit in 69 and by 1970 it was starting to, to waver but it, 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 it they, they were wonderful wonderful days everybody loved everyone it's not like today everyone blowing each other up uh it, it, love was in the air but having said that remember i'm in england in the uk of uh, in the usa of course you had vietnam going but we knew nothing about vietnam in the uk that was that was a a, 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 a foreign war it's nothing to do with us so i don't know what the scene was like in in the us in the 60s uh, they tell me hey, ashbury and all that was equivalent to ufo but i don't think so english is always best what is this going out to America? <laughs> <laughs> That'll so, be fine, uh, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You mentioned before, and you, you used a nice phrase um, describing it, saying that, that once you got the taste of Pink Floyd in your mouth, you, you never forget it or something. Mm -hmm. And it, it's the same yeah. for me. If, yeah. if I recall the time when I was very young, young, like 12, 13, 14, and I started listening to music a serious way, of course, I listened to The Doors, to Led Zeppelin, Deep Purple Made Japan, so many yep, great yep. bands, really, really yep. great bands. But Pink Floyd, even at that time, was yep. different. They were somehow 
I would say outer space. They came from outer space and I never understood it because I never knew as many, never knew who's behind it. Of course, at that time, you did, did not have any information, any more information. It seems as sure. you, you know much more about Led Zeppelin, much more photographs and everything. Uh, and I don't really know what it is. And until now, I mean, we talked to, to so many very interesting people like you. And still, this one thing this seems to be unsolved. Why and how mm -hmm. is it that Pink Floyd, for everyone who loves Pink Floyd at least, or hates Pink Floyd, might be the same, is so special mm -hmm. and not yep. really connectable. Even you were there on their live shows, you don't get the connection to just a regular music band, just regular artists. So how, how is it for you? Do you, not, do you have any idea how to describe it, the difference? Uh, run that past me again because I didn't quite get where you were going. Um, could uh, Do you have an idea what what it is, what would, what creates the aura from, on Pink Floyd in comparison to all these great other uh, bands that were out there in the uh, late 60s and early 70s? No, I, 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 I wish I knew. No, it's, it's impossible to answer. That's what I thought you were getting at, but I thought, no, you couldn't be asking me that because there's no answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, We're still yeah, digging, it, you know. It, it was always... Sorry? We're still digging. I missed that, sorry. Searching for it. Still digging, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I, I don't think even Pink Floyd themselves know. No, no, I, I don't think they do. It's a, just one of those things. They're just a, a very special group of people in those days. And, um, well, even today, sometimes they, <laughs> they can be good, but uh, we'll, we'll get on to Roger later on, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, mate. Yes, I, I've got a little thing going around in my mind. Yeah, I'm sure you will. <laughs> uh, cheers. So, Ian, do you got do you have any idea? I mean, we're we're looking for it for some time now, and all I got is that I know it's there is something different here, but I don't know what it is in the end. It's a special sound, isn't there? And. Uh, I always mm. go back to the thought of them being the sum of the parts. Um, I yes. think they had a very special combination between the four members yes. in, in both versions. I do wonder what they might have been mm. like as five. I keep on thinking about that recently. Oh, yeah. I, I, um, just, I, I, I wrote all my early memories down. and It's on my website somewhere, but... Mm. I remember, but I think I remember, obviously I'm wrong, one night at UFO that the five of them turned up. Now, that's not mm -hmm. documented anywhere. And so I figure, well, maybe I was imagining it. But there again, it might have been one of those nights when they had a, a fill-in. Was it Davey, um, oh, Davey O'List, was it, from the Nice that filled in one night? From the Nice. Um, mm -hmm. it, could, it could have been that night. I, I don't know. I don't know. But I just got this thing in the back of my head that I saw the five of them one night. But I, 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 I guess that's the figment of my imagination. But it's a nice one. <laughs> <laughs> they, they did. I mean, obviously, over the years, they brought people in, didn't they, for various roles. You have the singers yeah. in Dark Side of the Moon, you have the saxophonist, um, yeah. you have the yeah. second guitar in 77. And all of those things were great judgments, yeah. weren't they? They did make a difference. Oh, but certainly it was that yeah. core sound that the four of them were able to produce, which um, is, yeah. is very difficult to quantify. Um, but it has us all yeah. hooked. And I, I do um, tend to find that people that always either have quite strong feelings for or complete indifference about Pink Floyd. It's it's always one or the other. Yeah, and I'm always yeah, pleased sure when there's somebody new who comes along who, who takes the interest and sees it. So um, my son yeah. and I were um, listening to some Pink Floyd lyrics the other day because he's um, in a band um, which is just starting up properly and he's starting to write some lyrics. So we started to have a listen to some Sid Barrett solo work in order to think about yeah. how to yeah. structure lyrics. And I, undoubtedly that was 
high up in their skill set as well, particularly Roger, of course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Although that came a little bit later on, of course, because, uh, mm. you know, Sid was doing most of the uh, riding in, 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 in the early days, of course. But, um, mm. um, yeah, it, uh, it, it, it sort of... Somebody explained it to me once that... Well, I'm not musical, just so I don't play an instrument or anything like that. But somebody explained it to me once that the secret of their music is the pauses they leave in between the notes. And if you can wrap your head around that, it, it's that's probably that's probably the answer as to where their secret is, that they know when to stop and they know when to start. That's a really yeah. well good point made point. I I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. So um, so coming back I, I, to you, uh, oh, sorry, thing. in your yes. <laughs> Sorry, Neil, oh, Sam, no. I'm talking no, over no you. Problem. I promise not to do that. One, <laughs> can I ask you one more thing, more thing about um, the late 60s and 67 and so on sure. before we move off that subject? Because I know we must, but yeah. I do like it. Um, were you listening to the radio much then? Was there much going yeah. on on the radio yeah. in terms of Pink Floyd? Did, yeah. And did you listen to the yes. pirate radio stations, for example? I did. I did. Uh, Caroline and Radio London, I think it was in those days. And uh, I actually have a recording that I took off the radio in 1970, uh, a BBC uh, broadcast of Pink Floyd. And I oh. actually gave that to, to a friend of mine and it's out on bootleg. It came out years ago. So, But that, that came from my source or part of it did. There was a, a missing verse in it or something or other in the, the version that was there, but I had the full version. So I sent the tape over to the US to a good good mate of mine. I, I'm going to name check in, mm -hmm. Ron Tune. G'day, Ron. Um, and Ron uh, mixed it and put this little... Uh, uh, passenger music in that hadn't been there before and it was complete so wow yes i did listen to right there. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's good to know um because it obviously uh, we wrote that bbc radio book so i always have to check in oh um, that's right this is, you did like, too, yeah. this is like a personal interview for me forgive me nils on this but i have no to problem. get all my questions in here <laughs> it's like a cap it's a captive audience thing um one of the things I joke with friends is that if ever I spot anybody with long hair um, who's of a certain age, mm. I know I need to go and talk to them because they might have a Pink Floyd memory. Sure. Um, and um, you, you yep. definitely tick that box. And um, I remember right. years ago reading reading your articles on your on your Fleeting Glimpse site about your memories of UFO mm. in 1967. Um, and yep. I always think, um, I must say it. I must think they, they really ought to be captured in a book somewhere as well. I think they would really suit that because uh, they're very well told. Um, and uh, I reread them um, yesterday um, as part of my preparation uh -huh. for today. And I could go on about those all day um, because um, uh -huh. they're really fascinating. And anybody listening um, to or watching this, if we put a video version out, I would definitely recommend um, going and having a look at Cole's uh, recollections of 1967 because they're absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Over to you, Neil. You. Sorry, I interrupted <laughs> you. Can I, uh, can, no, it, can it, I just, can yes. I just uh, expand on that, Ian? Um, yeah, sure. Please do. I, uh, Please. Two, two, three days ago, I put one of those stories about actually about the 14 hour Technicolor Dream and I posted it to the Arthur Brown. Uh, I don't know. Have you heard of Arthur Brown, The Crazy World of Arthur mm. Brown? Yeah, Fire. Yeah, yeah, Fire, yeah. Well, that came later, yeah. but he used to mm. perform at UFO all the time. And it'd be Pink Floyd and Arthur Brown. It was always the two of them were, were invariably on the same bill or the next week or whatever. And so I posted this story mentioning Arthur Brown in that 14-hour Technicolor Dream write-up that I did on the site. And yesterday, Arthur gave it a tick and he loved it. And that's that was fantastic for me because he's one of my big heroes from those days. He's remarkable, isn't he? Um, in the late 1990s, um, they did, um, it was an event at the ICA in London um, near St. James's Park, the recurring mm. Technicolor Dream. And Arthur Brown came on at the end of that event. He was, I think, the headline act. 
um, yeah. and um, he had the um, headdress on fire. And so yes. there was me in the audience absolutely gripped because it was suddenly 1967 again because he, yeah. he didn't really look any different. <laughs> He's aged brilliantly. Right. I'd quite like to know who who looks after him or whether he looks after himself yeah. himself um, because he was great. What a show. Yeah. Yeah. What what year was that here? Yeah? Um, I would guess, and I'm going to get this wrong now and kick myself afterwards, but I'd say about mm. 1998 it would have been. Oh, okay. I went with right. Right. Um, in, um, but people might see if they see the video version in the background. Um, you've got the embryo book that I wrote at um Mm -hmm. the turn of the century with Nick Hodges and Nick and I went to that event and um, uh, we so enjoyed it and it was it was a great gathering um, and there were some really good speakers there at the time um, Hoppy Hopkins um, led uh, yeah. the event at the beginning and um, that was right. where my friendship with with Hoppy began and uh, he's somebody mm -hmm. I often still think about he's he's greatly missed uh, and uh, that yeah. takes us right the way back to UFO. And he was probably the person who made sure that that sausage went floating up the stairs. Um, and I think that image is going to stick in my, <laughs> it's going to stick in my mind today. That is a giant floating sausage. That's something for oh, yeah. the um, Pink Floyd experts to analyze. I, I only ever spoke to Hoppy once. I sent him an email once and I can tell you exactly what it said. It said, Hoppy, Thanks for changing my life. And he wrote back and said, it was a pleasure. I didn't say what it was about. He didn't have a clue what it was about, but I meant you, folks. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and so sad when he passed. Uh, yeah, he was a absolutely. friend. Yeah? Was he, he was, friend? yeah. Um, no, yeah, I no. used to go around and, and have some really good chats with Hoppy. And it's funny you right. should mention um, Hyde Park 1970 because it was his, yeah. his film crew. Um, that mm -hmm. organised filming it, and he had one guy on one side of the rafters and one on the other. Um, right. And um, uh, I was able to assist him um, some time ago with the restoration of of his film of that event. And um, we went off to an expert in London who um, regularly handles um, extinct video formats, um, 625 lines and all of that Sony format. Um, and um, we had some great chats and uh, I was forever hoping that Hoppy might say, oh yes, um, I've just discovered something um, in my <laughs> yeah. archive because he had quite the archive, but uh, I'm sure there was never unfortunately anything else other than that. And um, <laughs> in in my background, just above my headphones, if anybody sees a video version of this, is is you can see some rectangles in here because the lights on it a little bit. But um, is uh, a little uh, poster about um, international times, which was Hoppy's passion yeah. as well. And obviously, yeah, towards yeah. the end of his life, um, he was busy getting um, the newspapers digitally scanned and uh, making sure that they were available to the world um, because yeah. that was a really fascinating title um, back in the day, obviously. Um, you talking about it IT? Superseded. Yeah, IT. Yeah, yeah. And obviously yeah. it was superseded by Oz, wasn't it? Which is That's right. you. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Where you are. Yeah, no, IT used to be awesome. Then. You used to get so much information in there. That, that, that used to be... That was what all the hippies read was IT. Mm. That was it. Didn't mm. read the Times or anything like that. You just read no. IT, International Times. <laughs> mm. Mm. Yeah. Neil, are you still with us? <laughs> yes, I am. I'm, I'm listening. And I'm, I'm happy and excited. I mean, it's uh, absolutely. I'm, I'm happy about it. So it's no. uh, it's all good. It's all good. No. I, I would love to talk uh, with you a little bit about the uh, wonderful website, A Fleeting Glimpse. Um, at, at what point? Did you decide not not just to be a fan of Pink Floyd, but to do something about it? What was the idea behind it? Okay, that's a, a, a fairly easy story to tell. Um, when I first got on the internet, which would have, I was a reasonably early adopter, I think probably about 96, something like that. The internet had been around for two or three years and started to get popular. And the first two words I punched in to... Yahoo wasn't Google wasn't heard of in those days. Yahoo, I put in two words. Can you guess what they were? Led Zeppelin. 
<laughs> Pops. <laughs> 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 Not yeah. <laughs> and there was nothing. There were there, there were a couple of little tiny sites, and there was nothing substantial at all. I don't think Pink Floyd yeah. even had their own site. There was nothing. But I, I came across this. Uh, uh, look, I, how I first started on the internet was with a, 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 a mailing list called Echoes, where they'd send you a daily uh, bulletin of what was going on, like what people contributed to and whatever. I guess we'd call it a forum these days, but this was all, all printed. Um, and uh, that, that was my first introduction to Pink Floyd on the internet. And I read in there that somebody had a, a, a website of, of Pink Floyd. And so um, I went to it and it was crap. It was just, it was just rubbish, to be honest. I won't name it because the guy's still around. But I approached him and I said, look, um, I explained that I'd seen Pink Floyd back in UFO days and right through and um, would it be interested in um, uh, putting some of my stories of those early days on his website? And he wrote back and said, oh, Jesus, you know, I must have to pay you or whatever. He was so keen. So I wrote them. I can't remember the year I wrote them. So I wrote them and put them on his website. But his website went belly up after a few months. And I thought, well, that was a waste. I spent hours and hours writing these bloody stories and, and now they're nowhere. I thought, well, hang on. Why, why don't I set up my own website? I think, how do how do you do that? Didn't have a clue in those days, but I tackled it. And the very first thing I did was put up those six stories. And that's how the site started. And people started to contact me from there and say, oh, well, you know, so interested to read what your, your early memories. And, and I thought, well, wait a minute. It's, you know, they, they, these people are liking what, what I'm doing and I like what I'm doing. So... Um, so I started to expand the site, and boy, boy did I expand the site. Uh, I think, from memory, it, it, I, I'm pretty certain it, it, it's the oldest Pink Floyd site on the internet. Brain Damage yeah. came along uh, a year or so later, I think. Well, it was later anyway. And there was another one, uh, Neptune something or other. I've not oh, yes. I've had anything to do with them over the years, but uh, uh, they came along a little bit later as well. So... Yeah, my site has been there the longest, more, more than any other that I, that I know of anyway, uh, especially in the English-speaking language. There might be some in Europe, I don't know. Um, but that's how it came about. So uh, it started to build and build and build, and then I started to make different contacts and whatever. And at one stage there, after I've been going maybe two, three years, I was getting over 100 emails a day, uh, inquiries about Pink Floyd. And oh, this is crazy. Um, and this is before uh, uh, social media or anything like that. And so um, I, I became, or my site became, the point of reference for Pink Floyd fans. Uh, and it just grew and grew and grew and grew from there. And, and I just kept going. I kept going with it. it. All the time, though, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking... Jeez, all these bloody fans like in my band. How dare they? This is my band. <laughs> that, was, that was the thought that I had. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't want to share it with anyone. You know? um, but that, that's how the site uh, came about, and that's how it grew. And it just got bigger and bigger and bigger over the years. And that was it. Yeah. It sounds like it was a full-time job back in the day, was it, for you, with hundreds it of emails? Was. How it, did you keep up it, with that? Oh, it's just impossible. I mean, it was insane. But um, I, I remember doing some, some. I think it was Roger Waters who was doing um, the Dark Side of the Moon tour. And I, I, I was working at the time. I've since uh, retired long ago. But um, uh, I, I remember, like, people would contact me and say, hey, we've got a, a video of uh, Roger playing in Rio or whatever. And they'd, they'd email it to me and I'd process it and I'd get it up on the site. And one day, I, within three hours of the performance, I had a clip on my site of Roger performing and I thought that was amazing. But mm. my work didn't think it was so amazing because I'd be sitting up till 
four and five o'clock in the morning and having to get up at seven or eight o'clock to go to work and I'd spent all night on the bloody site and that was that, that wasn't just once that was many 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 times it's a huge investment isn't it and it has oh. been over the years oh absolutely yeah yeah but um um I I I did get a bit down with it a few years back um uh it started to get on top of me a bit and I thought, and then Roger announced yet another one of his bloody tours. And in those, in those days, I used to set aside a, a, a space for every single gig that he did. It didn't matter if I didn't have a review or pictures for it, I'd make a space for it on the site somewhere. And that was killing me because uh, it, it sounds simple, but you, you'd have to research, find out where the uh, place was, uh, uh, ticket links, um, you had to get pictures of the venue. Um, and so it, it was it was a lot of work and it was starting to get on top of me. And, mm. um, and then about seven years ago, uh, uh, he announced another tour, and I thought, oh, no, I can't do this anymore. This is just, <laughs> it's just taking up so much of my time. And, and so I started to lose a little bit of interest in the site. And actually, I think for a couple of weeks, I didn't add anything to it, which is very unusual because that site used to be updated daily. I mean, mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. daily. Um, and I sort of drifted off a bit. And then a, a, a chap came along and volunteered. He said, well, do you want someone to run it for you? And I said, yes, please. So I kept control. And this other fellow uh, started to do all the news stories and, and stuff like that. So that took the pressure off me. I was still there in the background doing uh, technical stuff. And, and well, that's know, totally still making... Uh, no, no. Uh, it's, oh, it comes okay. to Tony. Uh, no, his name is okay. Liam. But oh, okay. he, um, uh, uh, I don't know how to put this because it's public, but um, Liam, Liam was having some health issues, let's put it that way. And um, he uh, he quit in April this year, he just quit and saw it. And unfortunately, when he quit and saw it, he took uh, our Facebook page with him, which he'd set up, so I can't say anything about it. But that stole quite a few thousand members away from us. Um, and then he did it two or three days before I was due to take off on a, a huge overseas trip for seven weeks. And so for seven weeks, the site wasn't updated. But while I was away, uh, some of my contacts said, look, are you looking for someone to run the site? And I said, yes. And then that's where Tony came in. Tony, I, I, I've never addressed him by his surname, but I think it's, it's Rapata or R R he's, go, he's going to email me for sure when he sees it. Says, you stuff my name up. You don't say it that way. But yeah, that's when Tony came in and said, look, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to step in. And so in June this year, Tony became my new site manager. Or uh, uh, Yeah, he's, he's, and now he's responsible for all the news and everything like that. But mm -hmm. he came in green. He didn't know anything about websites, how to run them, uh, how to code them or anything like that. And the guy has been phenomenal because yeah. I give him something to do and he does it. And I go, whoa, how Brilliant. did you do that? And he just does it. You know, he's great. He's just awesome. So, um, yeah, I've been very, very lucky uh, to, to get Tony on board and he's yeah, very he's enthusiastic. He, he, yes. Yeah, yeah. He runs that site and I, 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 I just step back. I give him pointers and stuff like that and shuffle things around a bit. But he, he's the main driving force these days. And, and uh, it's nowhere near like it used to be. The site is nowhere. Since social media came in, we took a pound in, let's face it. I think at one stage there, I remember the day... Sid, the day Sid died, we got something like 70,000 hits in one day. Wow. Wow. It was massive. Um, but then that tapered off over the years. And uh, it, the site used to average between eight and 10,000 a day or something like that, but it's significantly less than that now since social media came along. Um, mm. That's why 
I resisted social media for many, many years until uh, Liam, who was the guy before Tony, uh, said, why don't we do social media? And I said, I hate Facebook. I don't like all that stuff. And he said, well, I think we should give it a go. And he was right um, because mm. um, we, we do have a presence in so, uh, uh, across all platforms now. And, uh, and we're starting to build again. Um, and if I could put out a plea, if you go to Facebook, please go to a fleeting glimpse and sign up. We need some more members. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Well, and then that leads people onto your site, doesn't it? And all of that That's right. content. That's right. And That's right. it's yeah. certainly extremely rich for content. It's oh. just something that you can just spend all day digging around on because yeah. one thing leads to another. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's a legacy uh, already. Uh, not, uh, thank you. Um, not... It would have been a few years in, uh, yeah, because social media was around. I, I got an email one day from a guy, and he said, I'm a, oh God, I can't think of the rank. He was someone in higher ranked in the military in the US, a colonel or something of that nature. And he said, I'm a colonel in the US. I've been to your site, he said, and I intended just to spend one night there. He said, it's now three weeks later and I'm still coming <laughs> through your site and I haven't seen it all yet. <laughs> so I know, it's, I know it's big. If you want to dig in there, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of pages. So, mm. go for it. so you told us before that um, when you first uh, got into Pink Floyd, you had the idea of, I want to meet them. I want to meet the people yes. behind the band and everything. So did you also yes. use that? fan side as a vehicle to get closer to the band or was it a coincidence uh, i think i probably did use the website um i started to make some really really good contacts in the early 2000s and um i can't remember the exact year but i i, I was in direct contact with roger's manager i was in direct contact with pink floyd's manager at that time, and I'm now in contact with the current manager. Um, mm. And so that started to give me um, a little bit of, um, I don't know what the word is, but um, authenticity, I guess you, you could say. Yeah, credibility. Um, credibility, thank you. That's mm. that's mm. fits in there better. Um, and uh, I went to the UK in 2005, have a guess what for? Uh, could have been Hyde Park. It could have been. It could have been another concert <laughs> in Hyde Park. <laughs> yeah, I went over to a live boat. And uh, when I was there, I've got lots of stories to tell about that time. But um, w when I was there, we, we actually had uh, Matt from Brain Damage and myself. We had uh, uh, dinner with uh, Pink Floyd's then manager. And we did it again the next year. But that's not the point of the story. But when I was there in 2005, I met up with a guy from uh, an Australian Pink Floyd tribute band called Beyond the Dark Side, who I'd seen a few times. And they, they, we had a, a bit of a meet-up in, in London before the concert. And he said to me, oh, I said, we're, uh, we're touring uh, Germany. Oh, no, no, we're touring, we're touring uh, England next year, and we want you to come. I said, what? You want me to what? He said... I want you to come on tour uh, with, with us around England next year. And I go, well, what am I going to do? He said, we just want you to report what we're doing. <laughs> I'm coming, well, that's easy enough. But I thought, oh, he's been on the drugs a bit or whatever. <laughs> and uh, thought no more of it. And then I got back home and a couple of months later, I got an email and it said, sorry, we're not touring the UK, we're touring Germany. And it, we'll send you your tickets and your accommodation, your food, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, come on over. So, yes, <laughs> the site led to that. That was a free trip Brilliant. around Germany because I was, I, I was reporting for them on the site, and the promoter over there was loving it because he's thinking, oh, you know, this guy's involved in Pink Floyd, so he can't, you know, be doing our, our band any damage. He's got to be sort of promoting them. And um and that's one of the one of the things that the site did for me. But a little bit later on than that, 
I think it was in 2008, um, a forum I was running at the time, which is still current, I know it's different these days, um, they all collected together for me and flew me over to the States to see uh, uh, one or two of Roger's concerts. And again, they right. paid for airfares, accommodation, food, the lot. Everything was paid for. And I went, wow, this is great. I'm doing something I love and I'm getting paid for it. This is so good. And um, so that, and I so they did it again. I think twice they did that, took me to the States for, for free. And, you know, thanks, guys. I love you. <laughs> So, Wonderful. so meeting all these guys, the management, and and as I understand, you met some uh, members of the band itself. Um, did it change anything for you in your, you know, emotionally about Pink Floyd, getting closer to the band? It got, it gave me a bit of a big head. <laughs> 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 I, I uh, yeah, when I first started to meet the the, the support band uh, at first, and uh, I remember bumping into Graham Broad one night, uh, the drummer with Roger at the time, and um, uh, getting uh, to talk to him on a real personal level. It was wonderful. Uh, he really opened up to me, and, and we had a great conversation. And that's when I think things start to turn around a bit. Hey, I know these guys. I got introduced. There's not many of the... Pink Floyd support stuff or support people. I, I don't know how you, to phrase that properly, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, like Guy Pratt, who's just a wonderful, wonderful guy. Um, you know, I've known Guy nearly 20 years now. Um, Storm Ferguson. I became very, very... Storm and I were like that because uh, I met him in Sydney. I flew down especially... I live in Queensland, in Australia, so I flew down especially to see Storm, and he was so knocked out that somebody uh, would do that that he gave me this. Uh -huh. says, behind. And yeah. that says to, to Cole from Storm. So, uh, and we we just got, and at one stage he said to me, Would you like me to redesign your site so I can make it more Pink Floydish? And I said, yes, please. But unfortunately, he got tied up with other projects and then unfortunately he passed away. So that never got done. But mm -hmm. yeah, so um, meeting all those people, it certainly it certainly did change me. And, and, and meeting one led to meeting another, to, to another, to another, and, and, and so on. And now um, if you go to my site, you'll see that I've met Roger four times, uh, all by personal invitation, the last one. Didn't turn out too well, but we'll go into that later on if you like. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, just a few weeks ago, I met, met with Nick for the first time ever, and what a wonderful man he is. He's just fabulous, just fabulous. I had a 20-minute conversation with him about, I think we, I said this earlier on in this broadcast, uh, we were talking about UFO and, and the early days and and oh, just, yeah. So, so yeah, um, one thing led to another, to another, to another, to another, until I, 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 I met so many people uh, in the support band, uh, in the support cast or whatever you want to call it, that um, I feel fulfilled. I, I, I did just about everything I wanted to do, what I said I was going to do in 1988, was to meet the band. I just about managed that, except unfortunately never got to meet Rick because he passed. And I've never met Dave, even though I've had, I've got to be careful, I've had some conversations with him, let's put it that way. Well, I don't know about you, Niels, but I want to hear more about Roger. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you want to start? <laughs> well, four times. Um, I know people yeah. will be thinking, what happened, What went wrong on the fourth? But tell us the good stuff first. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I can't remember the years. Excuse me, I'm getting no. old. But, there are but, pictures, um, aren't there, on the site? So yeah, there are. Actually, up. if I look over there, I've got another computer running with my site up on it, but I won't, I, I, I won't cheat. Mm. Uh, the first time I saw him, I think it was in Melbourne. Uh, it uh, would have been... Um, Thousand eight. Can't remember. Sorry. Two thousand eight. Yeah. Um. I'm trying to think of the tour. Um. It was the dark side tour, I guess. Dark, dark side. Dark side. Dark side. Yes. Dark, dark side. 
yeah and, and, and that was the first time I met him and I remember um I, I, I was standing outside uh the theater wherever it was and uh, a guy came up and started to ask me questions I think he recognized me from a site I get that a lot by the way and um uh he started to ask me questions and I'd heard that there was a, a, a vacancy or there was a spare spot for somebody to go and meet Roger backstage and I said to this guy out of the blue hey how would you like to come backstage and meet Roger Waters <laughs> <laughs> the guy nearly died on the spot he said come with me come on and so we go backstage I think it was before the show and um Roger's tour manager came out and said uh look He'll come in and have a chat with you in a minute, but you're not to ask him any questions. Well, what? Can't ask him any questions. But I said, why is that? I will, before he goes on stage, he always has a bald lolly and he can't speak. <laughs> this is bullshit. This is rubbish. And uh, Roger came in and he did speak. And he was, he was really quite nice. There was probably six or eight of us in the room or something like that and he had a quick chat with each one of us and we got autographs and the usual usual stuff and then a few years later i i, I can't recall what tour it was or whatever or i think it might have been in the us so I, I, I don't recall uh but i got to meet him again um and he was a little bit gruff that time and mm. i met him in brisbane uh and he was really really gruff i don't know why i had my wife with me on that one and she said oh he's a horrible man I'm like, oh, okay. um and then of course there was the uh the, the famous or infamous meeting with him at the wall uh thing in brisbane i can't remember what year that was either about five years ago or something like that and what what had happened was I got the invitation to meet him backstage and it said, when you, you know, ask for this particular guy and he'll arrange for you to go backstage. So uh, I took this fellow with me, and you're not going to believe this, but the fellow I took with me to that meeting was the same guy who I'd taken in to meet at the Melbourne. <laughs> thing all okay. those years before and he kept in touch and he knew that i had contacts and but he bought me a thousand dollar ticket bang in the nice. bang in the middle front row thousand dollars he spent on me such a great guy so the two of us lobbed up and there's these things there's drinks and that before the show and everyone's milling around so we were just talking away and the show started and off we went, watched the show and at the interval we went back to the same room and I thought, oh, I'll go and grab that guy now. And uh, he said, oh, yes, 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 you're here to see Roger, aren't you? That's right, okay, come with me. And it was all downhill from there, I'm afraid, because we waited, there's videos on the site of it. We, we waited and waited and waited and it, 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 this is at interval time. Mm. and uh, he came out to do the second half and he saw me and Michael, the guy who had taken him with me and um, uh, Roger, no, Roger's manager wasn't there but someone in Roger's camp was there and um, he eventually came out of his room and he said, what's this? What's, what's, what's all this? Uh, I went, oh, this is a very good start and he he said, I'm not fucking doing this. Sorry, I don't know if you cut this out or what, but I'm not fucking doing this. And I said, what's the problem? I'm working, I'm working. And and just carrying on. And I said, well, can we get a photo? Oh, yes, you can get a photo. I said, and somebody, all the photos I got prior to that, he wouldn't smile in them. So I said to him, would you mind smiling for me in this photo? He said, I've been smiling all my fucking life or, or something like that. <laughs> so he took a photo and then took off. So that was it. And I was shouting out, Roger, and his people were saying, shh, 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 don't say, I'm saying, Roger, Roger. So we don't talk in <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> which, which leads me to the uh, next well, question. Yeah. Um... <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> what do you think about the uh, Darks of the Moon Redux? Any feelings oh, about it? Did you, uh, did you give it uh, yeah, I've got, room? I've played it twice. Okay. Uh, 
Rogers fans are going to hate me, but uh, you know, I, I'm, I am honest. I, I, I tell it like it is. It's crap. It is crap from start to finish. There's no redeeming features about it at all. It's just a guy cashing in on something that he did 50 years ago. And I think it's bloody horrible. Can't be clearer than that. No. <laughs> I thought the same in the beginning. Live. You saw it live. Yeah, mm. tell, tell us about it. I saw it live and it was a lot better than the ah. record. Ah. One of the two performances at the Palladium, yeah? I did. I went to the second Palladium performance and mm. I was really pleasantly surprised. Um, mm. I went with really low expectations. It was more yeah. about who I saw that day and who I met. And it was pretty good. Um, Roger's mm. out there, though. Um, his stories about um, saving a duck and all of that, which... Mm -hmm. um, were quite really quite strange and i i wondered whether he was being serious or not or whether he was actually having some really extended complicated joke um i think he was probably serious though yeah, yeah. Uh, but the music coming back to the music was really quite good he was greatly helped by his band yeah. um and he seemed pretty uncomfortable out there on his own without all of that backing that he's well used to having and yeah. I think maybe he found it a humbling experience. That's interesting. Was I that could see a very change. Second? The second was the show. I wasn't. Second show. Second, yeah, right. okay. I was at the second show. I hear the first show was a lot worse than the, the second. Yeah. yeah. And that's. Um, yep. It was. Yeah. It was. It was actually really quite good. And I was very glad I went. I went for the cheapest seat in the house. That was mm -hmm. all I thought it was worth. Sorry, Roger. Um, and um, it gave me a great view because I was able to look down on him and see what he was doing because he had a desk at the front of the stage and right. uh, times he was playing patience with a set of cards, for example, and that sort of detail you wouldn't have actually have seen from the front row of the stalls particularly well, but I could see right. what he was doing and I could watch him shuffling his notes and so on. And yeah, it was actually pretty good. So okay. my thought on it is, is if he does some more of that, and if he does it in small venues, go and see it, I would say, because right. it's a hell of a lot better than the last time I saw him um, at Wembley or wherever it was in the late 90s. And that was blooming awful. Mm -hmm. And I said I'd never go well, again. But well, I'm one of those people who's, who's very much stuck in the past. Um, so I'm really hard to please. You and me both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, um, uh, funny you should yeah. say that, though. Sorry, Bruce. No, no, you're first. I was just going to say, a friend a friend of mine from Sydney, he flew over just to see the two Palladium shows. Mm. He was not impressed. He said it was a waste of money, basically. So, sorry, Nils. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the the first time I listened to Money, as as we all did, and I was, I would say, irritated and confused. I hated it, <laughs> to be honest. And then mm -hmm. uh, I think it, it was time it was the next uh, snippet we got. And I thought this was awful too. And I think they did it and he did it all wrong in the beginning. I mean, giving us something like money as a teaser, which is part of a poem, part of a, it's it's like giving a, a theatrical piece, giving out and just giving yeah. you like 20 lines or one actor. You don't get it. You don't understand right. it. And I think right. it was totally wrong doing it. And the whole thing, if you would have called it not Darks of the Moon Redux, and telling everybody that this will be the final version of the Darks of the Moon, but telling everybody mm -hmm. this is my personal, poetic, lyrical, whatever piece, how I see Darks of the Moon, connected to my memories, my experience, and where I am in life right now, and not giving out any pieces in the beginning, or only mm -hmm. audio, mm -hmm. you know, no poem, no yeah. talking, whatever. Yeah, yeah. After yeah. listening it, to, to it, uh, I would say 50 times now. Mm. I quite like it because I understood it as a piece in total. And I, I just listening to it as a total in total, not track by track. And I think under these, if you, if you think of it as a piece, it's quite nice and it's very different. 
but he did it all wrong, being narcissistic as he is, that mm -hmm. he's putting it out as, you know, the the version of Dark, the dark Side of the Moon, how it should have been. And that was so wrong from the beginning. Yes. And I think the, yes. the recording in the end suffers a lot from that bad narrative. Mm -hmm. I think it's not as bad as uh, we think it is because we compare it to something it's not comp comparable to. Hmm? You, you, you're spot on with that, Nils, because I can't help but compare it. I can't look at it as a a, a piece on its own. I, 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 as soon as I hear it, I'm, I'm back to the original, and I can't help that. That's just in my head, and uh, to me, it's horrible. Sorry, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I know I know Rogers fans are going to love it and all that, but I, I don't, and that's the truth. Mm. Yeah. So here we are, Roger Waters. What a guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. Talking about mu music, um, if, if you listen to Pink Floyd, I don't know if you listen to Pink Floyd these days at all anymore, but yeah. if, yeah. if you do, what, what, what yeah. do you listen to? Do you listen to the studio albums or official releases or do you do you like the live concerts most? Or No, I've gone right off the bootlegs and live concerts apart from Pulse. Um, uh, I, I, that, that's in my past. I used to trade tapes and CDs and do all that thing and um, listen to these crappy recordings and try and listen to the music between all the noise and uh, no, I, I don't listen to bootlegs anymore. I, I, I'm, I'm just into the official stuff and, and that's it. Uh, mm. Okay. What do you I usually see. play? What 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 album would you um, might go on each well, week? Um, uh, Dark Side. I, I can't get past Dark Side. It's uh, mm -hmm. yeah. It's, 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 in my opinion, Dark Side is the second best record ever ever made. Ask me what the first one was. What's the first one? Sergeant Peppers. Ah, oh, yeah. I thought you well, might that, say that. That was perfection. And then, mm. then Dark Side came along, and that was perfection. So there's that much between them. But mm. um, yeah, so my my go-to is Dark Side. Every time, every time I hear Money Start Up, I go, Oh no, not again! And when it's finished, I go, Wow, wasn't that good? <laughs> yeah. Every time. Yeah, it's not no, getting old. No more. Oh, it's so yeah. good. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. Uh, yeah. So, but the um, yeah, that, that's uh, that's my go-to. But the, the big four were really, I suppose, the uh, animals wish we were here and um, what was the other one? I've forgotten. But uh, um, they're, they're they're my go-tos. I've seldom play. Um, uh, the early stuff I, I i i can't remember last time i played piper or or any of the early film soundtracks that you know all about nils um uh, it'd be a long a long time it's i, I just stick to the, the more popular stuff i guess these days mm. yeah for me it's, it's mostly it's, uh, it's a funny thing because for me it's mostly the bootlegs and the live recordings mm -hmm. and and of these I almost only listen to those who uh, I got on CD or tape in the early 90s because it's connected to me, to the emotional. Yeah. It's an emotional con connection and I remember things. And it's uh, I, I played the final cut, the studio final cut, a few days back again. And it almost overwhelmed me because I l didn't listen to it for a long time. And that again, mm -hmm. uh, 1985 was a very strange time for me personally and I all you know the the musical style on final cut just put puts me back into that time so right. even there are so many very very nice recordings recently surfaced like Brescia on 71 and anything I don't listen to those but once to have oh it's great right. but then I I listen again to Oakland 77 San Diego Fillmore East mm -hmm. and all these, mm -hmm. all because yeah. these were the bootlegs yeah. I bought on the flea market in Bonn. And I remember right. all these right. feelings I had back then. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, that's uh, that, that that's old school for me, Neil. Was I? <laughs> I don't live in that world yeah. anymore. I used to. I used to. Yeah. <laughs> I used to. Used to love it. But uh, no, these days I, I I guess I'm more interested in the more polished stuff than listening to somebody coughing while careful relax your jeans playing or or whatever. You know. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's me. Yeah. So, uh, Ian, if you're fine, I would say it's a wrap up for today. I agree. I mean, this has been an absolutely fascinating conversation. Yes. You've got me <laughs> thinking about a lot of things and um, great admiration for what you've done with your website over the years. Yes. And okay. I would just like to say thank you because I'm one of the people who visits regularly and have done mm -hmm. over the decades. And right. I've forever found it fascinating. Um, it's been a factual resource to me. It's entertaining. Um, and I like its quirks, your site. Um, if Storm had made it more Pink Floyd, it might have been more polished and perfect. But I quite like the fact yeah. that, you know, sometimes it's just like, here's a story, we're putting it out there. Um, and yep. I enjoy it as it is. So please don't change anything. And no, do keep I going and if you if you run out of energy make sure you've got some good people supporting you and i was really glad to hear <laughs> that you you have found somebody this year who can can assist yeah. you to keep the show on the road so thank you yeah. thanks for thank you for your kind words that's very nice thank you the um it's it's nice to know that people are appreciating um something that i've done <laughs> so um I, I do appreciate that so Thank you very, very much, Cole. It was really great. And thank you all listeners for listening to the latest episode. And please do not forget to subscribe, not to miss any upcoming episodes. Thank you very much, Ian, for being by my side. Thank you very much, Cole. Talk to you soon. Bye. Pleasure. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.